My name is Ricky Reslavian, and I will stop at nothing to teach the world about itself. Hold on to your seats, because the Emperor is here. Welcome back to the Emperor Reslavian Studios, where today we will be t- tackling the topic of the culture of ancient Greece. And we're going to start out today by looking at what the Greeks believed. Now, the early Greeks, like many early cultures, were polytheistic. They believed in many gods, and these gods were generally connected to things in nature. Um, The Greeks believed that if they could convince these gods to be on their side, that if they could please these gods, uh, they would intervene on their behalf and make things like good harvests come and perhaps allow them to have safe journeys when they traveled at sea. And so the way that they would do this is they would worship them at temples that they built. They would make sacrifices at those temples, and they also would worship them uh, at various festivals that were held throughout the year. So, Greek temples are very iconic, and we can see them throughout Greece today if we would visit, and we can see that this architecture um, became a very essential part of what the ancient Greek culture was all about. One of the most famous ancient Greek religious festivals was, of course, the Olympics, which was originally started as a festival to honor Zeus that was held at Olympia every four years. The Greeks actually used this as a basis for counting time, and Olympiad was the period, the four-year period between Olympic Games. And these started out as athletic competitions, um, originally with a sprint race in which the runners competed naked, uh, but eventually the games would be changed and it would be events would be added like the discus throw um, like wrestling and um, eventually there would be chariot racing and even a race with a full suit of armor on so these olympics were very important and at them not only would it be a time when war had to stop um, but it would be a time when they would make sacrifices to zeus and it was a really important part of their culture Another piece of Greek culture would have to be their oral tradition or their tales, their poetry, their writing. And when we think about epics, we have to think about one man, Homer, who's traditionally seen as a blind traveling poet who would go around and tell stories. His two most famous stories are, of course, the Iliad, which discusses how the Greeks are would have defeated the Trojans in the Persian War using a trick of the Trojan horse. And then the sequel to that of the Odyssey telling how the the hero of the Iliad, Odysseus, um, angers Poseidon and it takes him 10 years to return home in which he battles many monsters like a cyclops and a witch. And his men are turned into pigs and it's pretty crazy. Another very important person when we talk about Greek literature is this man, Aesop. Aesop is traditionally seen as a Greek slave who told fables or a short story that was intended to teach a lesson. The moral or the lesson of a fable was the most important part, and many of these fables are an important part of our culture today, like the grasshopper, the tortoise and the hare, and the wolf in sheep's clothing. Now, another big part of Greek culture was drama. The Greeks, we have to credit the Greeks with starting the foundation for drama or a story told by actors who pretend to be characters in a story, right? The foundation for the TV shows that you watch, the movies that we go to, um, it all can be traced back to ancient Greece. Theater was actually a religious element for the Greeks. It was often conducted as a part of religious festivals to the god of theater, Dionysus. And so... Many times throughout the year, they would hold um, theatrical festivals in which playwrights would compete. Now, Greek theater looked a little bit different than what you might, you and I might imagine when we think about a play. Um, first of all, um, the actors wore masks, and there were only male actors, and uh, these plays included music and dance. And so, um, the Greeks developed two main types of theater, tragedy, Um, which of course had to have been a very sad play, but it was the ultimate sad play, a play in which the main character has flaws within himself. He struggles to overcome them, but he ultimately fails, and oftentimes he and many people in his life around him will ultimately die. Comedy, on the other hand, was the Greek soul as any drama that had a happy ending. 
Now, whatever was comedy or tragedy, these plays looked different than the plays you and I might imagine. The earliest Greek plays basically were a collection of people known as a chorus that would chant or sing or tell a story along with music. And so we had the first actor, Thespis, step out of the chorus and begin to take on a character of his own. Then these early Greek plays were filled with one actor and a chorus. Now, that does not sound very exciting to you and I, perhaps, but this one actor could change masks, they could take on the role of the characters, and there could be dialogue between them and the chorus. Now, early Greek theater also usually uh, had some bigger themes behind it, like perhaps what the nature of good and evil, what kind of rights does humanity have, what role does religion, what role do the gods play in our lives. And today we're going to meet um, three tragedy writers that are perhaps the most famous playwrights in all of ancient Greece. Um, I call these three people, since they wrote tragedies, the Sad Boy Squad. The first one is Aeschylus, the second one is Sophocles, and the third one is Euripides. And together, these are the three most famous tragedians uh, of ancient Greece. You'll notice they all have matching tra I Love Tragedy tattoos. So each one of them also was incredibly revolutionary. Aeschylus was the first playwright to use two actors. He introduced costumes and props, things that we would assume would be basic today. And his most famous play is Orestia, which the basic premise or the moral of it, that is if you are mad, you should not seek revenge. Now Sophocles comes along and expands the game even further. He adds up to two or even three actors. He even paints scenes behind the, the actors. And Sophocles is most famous for the play Oedipus Rex and the sequel to that Antigone in which we have the ultimate tragedy in which our main character Oedipus accidentally kills his father and marries his mother to, at which the end of the play he discovers this flaw in his life and at the end he gouges out his eyes talk about tragedy that is sophocles now euripides his plays he wanted to get away from the involvement of gods and goddesses and these greek heroes and he wanted his plays to focus more on real life and he is known for questioning and challenging the traditional thinking of the ancient Greeks. Now we can't end with three tragedies, we have to focus on one funny side of things here. So we're going to check out Aristophanes. He's the most famous Greek comedy writer, and I like to look at him as perhaps the forerunner to Saturday Night Live. He makes fun of politicians, scholars, he wants his viewers to have to know what's going on in the world around them to get his jokes. He wants them to be able to expand their minds with his humor, and his plays were very funny. Now, the Greeks not only had amazing playwrights, they also had amazing engineering to celebrate this theater. Theaters were built all around the city-states of ancient Greece. The most famous is the Theater of Epidaurus, in which was constructed so perfectly to have perfect acoustics that you could hear a coin drop in the center of it if you're in the back row and it is some place you can go, still go visit today. Now let's take a look at more traditional types of art, you know, painting of pottery and sculpture. Um, the Greeks were experts at that as well. When we talk about Greek, scu Greek sculpture, we have to think about this discus thrower, um, which is the, probably the most famous example of Greek sculpture. Greek artists loved the human body. They loved to use it uh, in their art, and they tried to make humans out to their ideal selves. All Greek art attempts to show reason, moderation, balance, and harmony, and this was something that they hoped to express not only in pottery or paintings, but also in architecture. And so when we look at these grand temples of ancient Greece, which we've already discussed, the Parthenon, um, these temples also attempted to express those characteristics. Now, Every temple in ancient Greece had a walled room known as a cella in the center, which contained a statue of the god that it was worshipping, and they generally had large columns supporting the building around the outside, and we had sacrifices made um, on altars at the temple as well. These temples and columns were originally made from wood, but famously, eventually they were made from marble, in which workers would literally chisel each block from nearby quarries to the construction site in which they were fastened together using wooden pegs, similarly to how a Lego brick clicks together with its peg and the 
this hole that the pen clicks into. When we think about Greek architecture, we have to think about the three orders of Greek architecture and the three capitals associated with those columns, the Doric order, the Ionic order, and the Corinthian order. Um, we can see them pictured here, and they are perhaps the most important part when we think about Greek art and architecture. Well, before we wrap up this episode, it's time that we go to the place of honor, and this week I would like to honor the comedy and tragedy mask. It was these masks that allowed Greek actors to change characters and to portray a variety of emotions. And just for the sake of demonstration, I will be demonstrating how one character could change their image and their perspective by wearing a mask. Clearly, we can see how their emotions would be demonstrated through this mask. I'm sad. Now I am an extremely happy character. So let's give it up to the Greek comedy and tragedy masks. Mm -hmm.